Hello everyone, my name is the Fox, and today I'll be reviewing Asus's latest laptop, the 2024 edition of the G16 Zephyrus laptop. Thank you very much to Asus for letting me borrow this laptop to review. This laptop is absolutely impressive from a variety of angles with only a few downsides as I can see it. With its high-end components packed into an exceptionally thin and lightweight Ultrabook, there are a number of variants that you can purchase. For this review, I'll be focusing on the model which has the NVIDIA RTX 4070. With its 16-inch screen, the device boasts an 88% screen-to-body ratio, emphasizing minimal bezels and maximizing screen space. Its dimensions are 35cm by 21cm with a slim profile of just 17mm thick, resulting in an overall weight of around 2kg. My version, the 4070 version, weighs 1.85kg, while the 4080 or 4090 models are slightly heavier at 1.95kg. Before diving into the detailed specs of this review, let's explore some key features of the device that are crucial for its usage, including some cool aspects you might not be aware of and a notable downside. Starting with the memory, the 4070 model I have comes with 16GB of LPDDR5X 7500 RAM. It's important to note that if you're looking for 32GB of RAM, the memory is not upgradable as it's soldered onto the motherboard. You'll need to opt for a higher-end model from the outset. As such, because you'll be going to larger NVIDIA GPUs, the price takes a sizable leap. Storage-wise, the laptop offers two PCIe 4.0 M2 2280 slots, with one already occupied by one terabyte SSD and the other available for expansion. Connectivity options include Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth 5.3. One of the highlights is the 90 watt hour battery Asus has included, which provides commendable battery life even under heavy gaming use, a significant advantage for a high performance laptop. What I find amazing is how thin and light the laptop is despite having this super large battery. Looking at the ports on the left side, there's a Thunderbolt 4 port supporting DisplayPort 2.1 and 100W PD3.0 charging, allowing you to forego the standard 200W power brick for a smaller charger when you are traveling. It should be noted here that I did play some of the games on this model using a 100W PD3.0 charger I have, and it worked just fine without actually consuming any energy from the battery. Naturally, the 4080 and 4090 versions will consume a greater demand. This side also houses a USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-A port, an HDMI 2.1 port, and a 3.5mm audio jack. On the right side, you'll find another USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-C port with DisplayPort 1.4 and G-Sync support, capable of 100W P3.0 charging as well, and an additional USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-A port, and a full-size SD card slot supporting UHS-2, catering to a wide range of connectivity and expansion needs. Now, on to the bigger specs on this device. Benchmarks will be coming later in this video. For now, let's talk about the CPU. Each model features the Intel Core Ultra 9 185H CPU, Intel's top-end mobile processor. However, there are a number of downsides to this particular APU. The iGPU performance from Intel's Arc GPU is non-ideal relative to power used, on top of which some games I tried benchmarking didn't even start with Intel's iGPU. More on this later. For this reason, for gaming use, I'd recommend just sticking to using the NVIDIA RTX 4070 laptop DGPU, despite ultimately having less battery life, but if you're plugged in often, this is a non-worry. To maximize CPU efficiency, Asus's Armory Crate software is invaluable for tuning, allowing users to easily manage the CPU's E and P cores. There is another issue I'm seeing with the Intel Core Ultra 9 185H, and that has to do with performance consistency. By just forcing all E cores off, that seems like an easy enough fix to ensure optimal performance. You can see this clip of Doom Eternal performance with all E cores running versus when I disable all of those E cores. It's a pretty drastic difference. The biggest star of the show are these custom OLED panels that Asus has made with Samsung and Nvidia. As such, Asus has significantly advanced the OLED laptop scene, so much so that I find this particular laptop easy to recommend from the display alone. Let's delve deeper into the specifics of this display. Asus calls this their Nebula series. The OLED display of the 2024 Asus model boasts a resolution of 2560 by 1600 with a 16 by 10 aspect ratio and covers 100% of the DCI-P3 color gamut. It features a 240 Hz refresh rate, G-Sync compatibility, and supports Dolby Vision HDR. A standout feature is Asus's implementation of anti-flicker technology, which can be enabled within their Armory Crate software addressing the PWM flicker commonly seen in other OLED devices like smartphones or even the Steam Deck OLED. Unlike these, Asus's OLED does not exhibit noticeable flicker due to its innovative pixel emissive technique, which ramps up the per pixel emissive capability to 960 Hz, four times greater than the panel's own refresh rate. This higher emission rate minimizes flicker, making the display more comfortable for those sensitive to it. The Asus G16 panel, in particular, delivers an unparalleled viewing experience. 
Like, no, seriously, it's like looking at a clear, vibrant painting. It just feels like silk on my eyes. Its rapid response time and the option for black frame insertion can massively enhance motion clarity. When capturing at high frame rate, it can be hard to notice, but if I grab a still frame, it becomes self-evident how clean the resultant image is. Asus has also innovated with OLED care technologies, allowing users to automatically hide the taskbar and dim inactive screen areas to prevent burn-in. Basically, it will only focus on the active window. This dual-purpose feature enhances both user experience and screen longevity. I would very much recommend enabling these features if you are getting this laptop. I am personally a huge fan of both of these options. A notable drawback involves integer scaling by Intel's Arc Control Panel. While offering options for scaled or pixel-perfect scaling, there is a mismatch in mouse resolution and pixel-perfect mode if you're using something that's lower than the native resolution, suggesting a bug that Asus could potentially address. Despite this minor issue, the comprehensive features of the display, including its flicker-free technology and exceptional response times, make it an outstanding choice for gamers and professionals alike. I genuinely can't say enough good things about this display, and moreover, I seriously wish Asus is working on an OLED panel for the Asus ROG Ally 2. Moving along to the design, the 2024 edition of the G16 is designed to appeal to a broader audience than just gamers. The design is for any users who prioritize portability, style, and performance. Asus says it's 25% thinner than its 2023 counterpart and introduces an aluminum CNC unibody design. The addition of slash lighting on the lid offers customizable LED patterns, allowing for personalization or a more understated look if desired. This particular feature isn't something that I'm big on, but if it's something you like, more power to you. Once again, the display has slim bezels, achieving an 88.4% screen-to-body ratio, and includes a 1080p IR webcam with Windows Hello support. Asus also claims significant updates have been made to the keyboard deck, increasing rigidity by 24%, compared to the 2023 model and minimizing keyboard flex. Also, the front-facing speakers provide notably great sound quality. I've never been someone to really remark on sound quality, but this is the first time I think I've been impressed by tiny speakers. The sheer presence of the sound that fills the air is different than just volume. The trackpad also deserves a mention as it's something like an oleophobic coating for smoother navigation, rivaling the feel of MacBook trackpads. I don't want to just glance over this particular segment, the touchpad on the new G16 is something I've been hoping Windows laptops adopted for like a decade now. It's excellent. The redesigned stealth hinge directs hot air away from the OLED display and the device maintaining a hidden profile. I continue to wish these laptop makers would include some type of kickstand to elevate the laptop for better airflow. Although thermal management remains efficient with the current design, as evidenced by thermal scans and temperature recordings. If you look at this graph right here, it's quite clear a few things happen. In this particular segment, the laptop is flat on the surface, and right here, I elevate the laptop with some makeshift kickstand. What we can note from here is a few things. Our performance stays the same throughout. The amount of power each component uses is the same. The only thing that changes is fan RPMs. The laptop goes from very loud to still loud. Still, it's evident that a kickstand obviously brings in more air, so it will be something I continue to wish for. Asus continues to use liquid metal for CPU cooling, maintaining temperatures within optimal ranges for both CPU and GPU. The GPU does not use liquid metal, however. It's well under its operating max temperature regardless. Also, Asus has a tri-fan layout that directs airflow efficiently across internal components. The last thing to note is that the bottom of the case includes a dust filter for easy maintenance. Looking at thermal video scans, we can see how heat is spread across the device when pushing the device to its limit. Overall, it's more than fine when using the device on a surface. For an idea of how loud the fan is, this is roughly what the device sounds like from two feet away. Before we start looking at gaming benchmarks, I want to take a brief look at battery life performance because this is going to help highlight why I recommend the NVIDIA 4070D GPU more often than using the Intel 185H APU exclusively. Obviously, if we were talking about non-gaming battery life, if you put the laptop at 150 nits of brightness and enable Windows Power Saving Mode, daily tests show that you can grab 9 hours of battery life. Basically, what this means is that total system power-wise, the laptop is using roughly 10 watts and, ex and is exclusively using Intel's 185H without the 4070D GPU active. So it's still possible and recommended to go that route for non-gaming tests. However, if we look at it through the lens of gaming, what we're going to see is that with the 4070, we're going to get around 80 minutes of battery life. 
Total system power will climb, but as we start reaching low battery levels, everything will go into a low power state, thus we'll see power drop, but naturally, performance drops as well here. However, if we look at using the Intel 185H for gaming, battery life gets to about two to two and a half hours of battery life, depending on the game and what's rendering. That increase in battery life has a massive hit on performance when comparing the two. So now, let's go into benchmarks to see what that looks like and see the downside of using the 185H for gaming. Okay, up first, we're going to be taking a look at Batman Arkham Knight. This is a late generation Unreal Engine 3 game. The resolution that I'm using is 1080p with max settings and no NVIDIA GameWorks. The reason I wanted to do no NVIDIA GameWorks was I had intended to test it against Intel's iGPU on the 185H. However, it doesn't even run on Intel's 185H. It actually crashes out. While it may be possible to use fixes and mods to get the game operational, that would also potentially change the performance, then I'd have to re-benchmark this. And I thought that this would be a better representation of the types of frustrations that you can potentially have while trying to run games using the Meteor Lake CPU GPU by itself. And one of the other reasons why typically I recommend just using the NVIDIA card. So here we are taking a look at benchmarks. We can see our average is 182 point. 2 FPS and our 1 percentile is 106.4 FPS. All right, the next game we're going to be looking at is Cyberpunk 2077. This is using their custom red engine. The resolution is 1080p. I am using the Steam Deck pre uh, preset. However, I am not using any upscaling whatsoever. So this is native 1080p. And now we do have the 185H with its Intel Arc present here. For our average FPS, we're looking at 92.1 FPS and our one percentile is 44.6. And when we take a look at the iGPU for the Intel side, we're looking at 21.8 FPS average and 6.6 .6 on one percentile. So if we were to take a look at our averages, we're looking like the NVIDIA is around a little bit over four times more performant, meaning that even though we get a roughly two and a half times more battery life using the Intel part, we're not really seeing that difference in performance. So in this particular benchmark, it really would make much more sense to always just be using NVIDIA solution, even if you have less battery life, because frankly, this is just not tenable. These, this performance is frankly unplayable. Okay, next on our list is Deus Ex Mankind Divided, 1080p with the DirectX 11 backend, and I'm using the Ultra preset. The reason why I like using this particular game benchmark is because it's one of the last DirectX 11 games that had no resolution scaling whatsoever and is a very DX11 hard game. So if we take a look at the G16 with the 4070 running, we're looking at 104 FPS average and 70.5 FPS one percentile. When we take a look at the Intel part, we're looking at 18.2 FPS average and 12.9 one percentile. When we take a look at the averages, we can see that the 4070 is almost six times better. And the Intel part, again, is only getting two and a half times better battery life. So this isn't a worthwhile compromise at all. Okay, the next game we're looking at is Horizon Zero Dawn. Again, doing 1080p. I am using the favorite performance preset, and there is no upscaling, so this is native 1080p. If we take a look at our 4070 result, we're looking at 127.4 FPS average and 76.5 one percentile FPS. With our Intel GPU using just the Intel parts, we're looking at 29.6 FPS average and 21.6 one percentile. If we take a look at our averages, we're a little bit over four times better performance via the 4070. Once again, showing that there are really isn't a worthwhile use case to be running the Intel part, especially if you're running at 1080p. You'd have to be running at something far lower just to be able to make this playable. Okay, the next game we're going to be looking at is Metro Exodus. This is using the 4A engine, and for what it's worth, the latest iteration is very taxing on GPUs. I'm using 1080p resolution with the Extreme preset, so I'm really attacking the GPUs, and we're going to be taking a look at a test that is really brutalizing our GPUs. Even on the GTX 4070 for the laptop version, we're looking at 40.3 FPS average. If we take a look at our 1 percentile, it's 25.9 FPS. If we take a look at the Intel GGPU, this is actually pretty decent considering, but still we're looking at... 10.1 uh, FPS average and 6.7 FPS one percentile. This is completely unplayable, but the point of this is to show the difference is once again still in that 4x range. The NVIDIA RTX 4070 laptop is generally speaking four times better than Intel's integrated part, and Intel will only give you around two and a half times better battery life. So think about this pretty heavily when you consider to think about using Intel's part, because for the most part, it never really pays off.
The next game we're going to be taking a look at is Red Dead Redemption 2. This is the Rockstar Rage engine that is being used, the latest modern version of it. We are running at 1080p, and I'm using the favorite performance slider. When I say all the way left, one of the things you can do is you got to make sure you push that slider. you got to twiddle it a little before you go all the way left to make sure that all the settings change to be favorite performance. And with these particular settings on the 4070 mobile, we're getting 98.5 FPS average and 66.8 one percentile. Compared to the Intel GPU, we're actually doing fairly decent here. We're getting 35.4 FPS average and 28.2 one percentile. This is a first case for us in any of these benchmarks where we see we actually could get to somewhat playable settings. If we look at our performance difference, we're only looking at a little bit over, it's 2.7 times better on the 4070. Considering that we get two and a half times better battery life on the Intel uh, iGPU, you're actually in a situation where using the, uh, the iGPU here is performance considerable when we think about how much power is being used. So we get almost two and a half times more battery life here, and we're almost getting, you know, the difference in performance. So when we take a look at this, that's pretty decent. This is a good relationship that you want to see. So this is one case where one game you could actually think about running on the Intel part if you wanted to extend battery life and have a commiserate performance to power used gap. And the last game that we're going to be taking a look at is Returnal. This game is brutal on GPUs, and one of the reasons why I love including it. I am running 1080p as the resolution. However, the preset I'm running is low, and I'm using FSR to balance mode. What this means is it's not actually 1080p, but it's you're going to be using a sub-resolution from FSR balance and upscaling to 1080p. So we have to do that because otherwise this game is going to be too brutal on us. We're going to have mostly unplayable frame rates. Now, I could use DLSS, but then I wouldn't be able to use that on the Intel part. So I'm using FSR balance because that is something that both of these can use. And if we take a look at this, we're looking at 89.1 FPS average and 55.7 one percentile. So with these particular settings, you can get a very 60 FPS feel, especially with that VRR OLED panel on the G16. When we take a look at the Intel part, we're looking at 27.3 FPS average and our one percentile is 17.4 FPS. This is considerably not playable, so you'd have to use something like FSR performance to actually bring up the gap here so you can get to something meaningful or play, uh, being able to play it. When we take a look at the difference in our averages, the NVIDIA 4070 is around 330% better, so 3.3 times better, roughly. And because we could use DLSS on the NVIDIA part, it still might make more sense for this particular game to be using the NVIDIA part, also because it has 8 gigs of its own VR, VRAM, whereas the VRAM for this is going to be coming from the shared pool, which is 16 gigs and cannot be upgraded. So that's it for my review on the ASUS 2024 edition of the G16 laptop with the RTX 4070. Most of my concerns about the laptop revolve around the issues with Intel's latest APU. There are going to be times when you, as a user, will need to change P and E cores if you notice games are acting weird and hitching. So you can just disable the E-Cores, and Asus provides that in their own Armory Crate software. In other cases, Intel's RGPU still has multiple driver issues. This is not an Asus issue. For instance, getting Batman Arkham Knight running requires third-party community patches to even get it in a running state. This isn't the end of the world because you can just rely on the 4070 and have a great time. And as I've already demonstrated in the benchmarks, the performance and power used aren't fair trades. Yes, we can get two to two and a half times more battery life using the Intel 185H, but typically this will mean we'll get four times less performance. So I personally don't think that's a worthwhile trade. But obviously this is very much a gaming concern I have. Other than that, the 2024 edition of the G16 laptop strike an amazing balance of thin light performance with good battery life and an absolutely amazing OLED display and also a fantastic trackpad. Everything Asus is doing is honestly excellent. If I had to fault Asus in particular, it would be that this particular laptop that I'm reviewing starts at $2,000 and you can't upgrade the RAM. And the only model with upgraded RAM also has a bigger NVIDIA GPU and the price climbs really high. The one saving grace is that we have 16 gigs of system RAM and the 4070 DGPU has 8 gigabytes of its own VRAM as well. So it is sufficient enough today but for me, I would look at 32 gig models myself, but I'd also wait and see if any good sales happen on those models. That's it for me. I hope this video was informative. As always, guys, thank you for your time. Thanks for watching.